Hi. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, I am going to be talking a little bit for the next half hour about squirting and G-spot and prostate play. And I'm so excited that you're joining. Um, if you only know us from Instagram and you're not super familiar with what the Pleasure Chest does, in all three of our cities, that's New York, Chicago, and LA, we offer free um, educational programming every week in all of our stores. If you come to any of our workshops live and in person, you get a 15% discount on anything in the store that night. Um, but even if you don't shop, it's a really great opportunity to come and learn about something that you can do with your body or somebody else's body. Um, so like I said, today we're going to be talking about um, squirting uh, and sponge play in all kinds of bodies. So the reason that I like to refer to both G-spot and prostate play um, collectively as sponge play is to kind of drive home this point that essentially... Um, everybody is working with the same kind of the same kind of bits in different layouts and I really believe that um, empathy is a skill that you can take into the bedroom and I don't just mean empathy in terms of being aware or in tuned to what your partner is feeling and paying attention to that although that is definitely important um, but what I mean is using your own experience and your own um, processes um, and your own responses to different kinds of touch um, to understand what your partner might be feeling and to translate that into how you're going to touch somebody else. Um, the other thing that I really love to say about sponge play is that it means that everybody, um, or it indicates that everybody has home field advantage, regardless of what your bits look like or what your partner's bits look like, or whether you are a queer person or a straight person or a cis person or a trans person, um, you have you have a lot to benefit from understanding both your anatomy and other people's anatomy and how those things are alike because it will help you translate um, sensations that you have felt onto um, or into things that you might be doing with another person, right? And have a better understanding of what they're experiencing, which is going to um, hopefully make you a better lover. Um, so I really love to talk about everyone having home field advantage and bodies being more alike than they are different when we talk about all kinds of sex play, but I especially, especially like to talk about it when we're talking about playing with sponges because I think it's um, something that we don't explore or talk about in depth as often and something that's sometimes kind of misunderstood. So um, what are the sponges, right? The sponges are the G-spot and the prostate. And the reason that I talk about them both collectively as sponges and talk about the process of playing with them as sponge play um, is because the G-spot and the prostate are in about the same location. They're made of the same kind of tissue. They excrete fluids that are chemically similar in composition. They have the same capacity for, for pleasure. They respond to the same kinds of touch. So regardless of which one you have, um, experimenting with your own sponge and playing with your own sponge is going to set you up to be able to play with somebody else's sponge uh, a little bit more effectively, which is great. Um, and if you've ever had other people play with your sponge and you didn't really know what they were doing, hopefully this will help you understand that a little bit better if you want to recreate it for yourself. Um, one of the things that I really like to kind of to, to always repeat about this layout is something that Barbara Carlos likes to say, who's uh, another educator that we work with sometimes, um, which is that everybody has the same jello in different molds. So let me explain that a little bit better, right? Um, if you are imagining a vulva, right, um, you're probably thinking about the external bits. Kind of in the top center, you might see just the tip or the glands of the clitoris poking out from underneath the hood. Underneath the hood of the clitoris is a shaft. Um, and inside the body, right, hopefully we all know that the clit is kind of wishbone shaped and has legs that extend down on either side of the vaginal opening, which of course is below the clitoris. The vagina is just that canal that's inside the vaginal opening. It's not the entire thing that we're looking at. Um, on either side of the clit and the vaginal opening are going to be the labia minora. And then on the outer, um, on the outer parts, those thick like peach-like slices, that is going to be the labia majora, right? In between the clitoris and the vaginal opening is the urethra. Um, we don't talk about the urethra very often, but I wish we did. Um, partly because I think that 
uh, at least speaking from my own experience, you know, some of us who had good Catholic upbringings, maybe we're not told that there are actually two holes down there, right? Because you're not supposed to look down there. You're not supposed to touch down there. Um, you're not supposed to engage with down there. And then you become an adult and you're like, oh, wow, there's like this whole other hole. What is going on? Um, so that little hole in between uh, that's below the clit and above the vaginal opening is the urethra, right? If we were to look inside the body, right? We, we often imagine, um, yeah, peach slices. We often imagine uh, penetration in the vaginal canal going kind of back and deep and only think of that. But just above the vaginal canal um, is the inside of the urethra, right? They're kind of parallel to each other, like these two um, overlapping tubes. And the urethra, of course, leads back to the bladder. Your bladder fills with pee, it comes out of your urethra. Um, and for a lot of us, that's the only sensation that we're really like, familiar with when it comes to our urethras is that feeling of pressure on it wherein we have to pee. Um, surrounding the urethra is this tube of spongy tissue, um, which is called the urethral sponge, very aptly named. And the urethral sponge, when your body is at rest, is just kind of hanging out there. It's not really doing anything. It's like a dry sponge. It's shriveled up. It's smaller. It doesn't really feel like much. Um, but once somebody with a vulva begins to become aroused, their urethral sponge starts to fill up with fluid and become engorged, fluid and blood, and get nice and full and squishy and responsive. Uh, now, the reason we think that the urethral sponge fills with fluid is in order to protect the urethra from getting poked and prodded uh, while you're having penetrative sex. So your body's going through this, this really helpful process where it's like, ooh, I'm turned on. I think I'm about to get laid. Let me do something in anticipation of penetration to make sure that my poor little urethra is not going to get irritated. Um, but it so happens that that big, full, fluidy urethral, urethral sponge or G-spot feels really nice to play with. Um, and then as you, either as you orgasm or as you're having um, penetration, you may wring out that sponge and expel some of that fluid in this process that we call squirting or ejaculation or gushing or flooding or whatever you wanna call it, right? Stuff comes out and it comes out of the urethra. Um, the fluid that is, that is ejaculated from a person with a vulva uh, typically is its own, its own type of um, prostatic fluid almost. It's antimicrobial in nature, which is also really helpful because if you think about it, if you have been rubbing your bits all over somebody else's bits and kind of uh, grinding your germs together, and then your body at the end of that process flushes your urethra out with this antimicrobial stuff that's gonna reduce your risk of getting a UTI, which is super helpful. Similarly, in a person with a cock, um, the prostate is also a gland of, of spongy tissue that during arousal becomes really engorged with fluid and with blood. And during the process of ejaculation, um, that prostatic fluid is, is picked up and passed through the vas deferens with, um, with sperm and semen and ejaculated out and also helps to flush out Okay, I think I'm back. Um, so anyway, like I was saying, the, the prostate fills up right with fluid similarly, and during ejaculation, a person with a cock also expels out. Um, everybody's body has pelvic floor muscles, and those PC muscles kind of wrap around your front door bits, crisscross at your taint, and wrap around your back door bits. And those are the muscles that hold all your inside bits inside of you. They're the muscles that contract while you're having an orgasm, um, and they're the muscles that we use to control our bladder and our bowel movements um, throughout our lives. Strengthening, so those muscles are, are what are squeezing when we come, right? And for some people, the particularly for some people with the vulvas, the squeezing of those muscles during orgasm is enough to kind of indirectly squeeze that sponge and wring it out. For other people who have G-spots and vulvas, their urethral sponge needs more direct pressure, direct stimulation, or a little extra help to get that fluid out of there. Um, typically, People with prostates ejaculate their prostatic fluid during their orgasm. However, if you want to completely wring out a prostate, if you want to have a fuller, more thorough experience of wringing out that sponge, you gotta touch it directly. Um, so let's talk about touching the sponges directly, unless anybody has any questions at this point. You can like type them in if you do, and I'll, uh, I'll try to answer you as we go here. Um, so, Touching the sponges involves um, a couple of things. Being really relaxed, being really well lubricated, and having an understanding of the process. 
Um, so being really relaxed is really important, um, particularly for folks with vulvas who want to ejaculate, because if you think about it, all of us have the ability to close off our urethra and prevent any fluid from getting out of there just by thinking about it, right? When you have to pee, you think to yourself, ooh, squeeze, gotta hold it, gotta hold it. Um, those instincts to not let fluid out of your urethra can definitely carry over in bed and you might find yourself feeling pressure on your urethra, which is actually from the fullness of your G-spot or your urethral sponge and consciously or subconsciously fighting that urge and trying to hold that fluid in and prevent yourself from what you think might be peeing all over your bed. Um, but you're not going to pee, you're going to squirt and it's going to be great. Um, if you're really worried about peeing while you're having sex or peeing while you're trying to ejaculate, empty your bladder before you start playing. And then you know intellectually, okay, there's nothing in my bladder, my bladder is empty. Whatever it is that's about to come out of me must be something else, right? Um, so think about the things that might be, that might be very overtly or more, um, more subtly kind of impacting you, making you stressed out, making you feel closed up and closed off if you're someone who doesn't naturally ejaculate very much and you want to. Similarly, if you have a prostate and you're going to explore playing with your prostate for the first time, um, because you don't have, a, presumably don't have a vaginal canal, maybe you do, but if you don't, um, the only way to access your prostate is gonna be through your butt. And because your butt has um, two sphincters at the opening and one of those sphincters is involuntary, you absolutely must be relaxed in order to get past it and reach your prostate. If you are not relaxed and you try to force anything into your butt, you're going to cause yourself pain. And that is definitely not conducive to a relaxing, pleasurable experience. Um, whether you're going to be doing G-spot or P-spot play with yourself or on somebody else, um, I highly recommend washing your hands, cutting your nails, and getting a really good lube. Now, if you have uh, long pointy nails, you can get a gay manicure with one of them short, or you can get some nice gloves and put some cotton balls in the fingertips of those gloves um, just to kind of soften things up a little bit. So once you've got your gloves on, you want a really good lube. Um, if you're using a water-based lube, it's good to look out for a lube that doesn't have glycerin, parabens, or glycols in it, which can be um, irritating, drying, or feed yeast. Uh, I really love lubes from Sliquid. They're all vegan and gluten-free, but more importantly, they're glycerin and paraben-free. They're pH balanced. They're not going to cause irritation. Avoiding irritation is really important for sponge play because especially if you are new to sponge play and new to exploring big ejaculations, you're probably going to be playing for an extended time, which is important and great and wonderful. And you should pack a lunch and prepare to be stayed for the day. Um, okay. So you've washed your hands, you've gloved up, you've got a really good lube on hand. Um, what else do you need to be ready to explore your sponge? Uh, one of the things that I really like to emphasize, particularly when talking about sponge play, is understanding the arousal cycle. Um, because the arousal cycle and how long you stretch it out is going to have a big impact on how full your sponge is once you start touching it. And the fuller your sponge is, the more sensitive it's going to be. And the fuller your sponge is, the more stuff is going to come out of it. And that's, uh, that's what we're going for, right? This is a squirt shop. You want to produce big voluminous ejaculations. you got to build up some volume. Um, so if you're not familiar with the arousal cycle, just to make it uh, really, really simple, you start off and your body is at rest, right? You're at work, you're sitting in traffic, nothing sexy is really going on for you. And then you find something that sparks your interest, something that elicits desire. Maybe you are crossing the street and you make eyes with someone really cute, or you get a pop-up for a porn that's actually really hot to you and you're like, oh my God, oh my God. And you start to feel like, hmm, I could come today. I could have an orgasm today. If I took this feeling and I did something with it, my orgasm is out there in the um, Am I paused? I think I'm here. Okay. So something has sparked your interest. You're like, orgasm, you're out there. I think that I could, I think I could have you today. Then you do something about it, right? You like sneak off to the bathroom to rub one out. You put snooze on your alarm and stay in bed a little bit longer. Whatever it is, you start touching yourself or somebody else starts touching you. You engage with your desire and start to, um, you start to experience pleasure and you start to reach the plateau phase. The plateau phase is the money phase, okay? I know that in entertainment, we think of climax as like the money shot, but this is like the money phase. The plateau is that, that period of time where 
not only is my orgasm out there in the ether as a potentiality for my day, I can, I can see exactly where it is. I can reach it. I can feel it. And if I just keep doing what I'm doing, I'm going to have it. I'm going to come right. That feeling in your body of like, yes, like I am going to get off from this thing that's happening now. Oftentimes, for lots of reasons, once you start to feel that feeling of, ooh, just don't stop and I'll come, you don't want to stop, right? Because you want to come. But what I want you to do is slow down. Maintain that feeling of my orgasm is, is reachable to me, my orgasm is present with me, but don't cross that line yet. The longer that you can draw that phase out where things are feeling really, really good, the more full your sponges are getting of blood and fluid, the more sensitive they're getting, the more endorphins you're producing, um, and the more you're going to be able to withstand a long period of um, some type of penetrative play, which is most likely what we're going to be doing when we're playing with sponges, although there are other ways that we can touch them too, right? Um, so once you're in that plateau phase, you really want to stretch it out. I think a really good way to do that is by layering sensations, right? A lot of us, uh, we figure out our pathway to orgasm. Maybe it's like nipples, nipples, clit, or like Hitachi, 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 done. Um, and that's really great when we're trying to be efficient. But the thing about relying on a single formula like that is that um, those few singular bits that we're focusing on can get a little overstimulated. Um, if instead we're engaging lots of different erogenous zones in our body, lots of different parts, experimenting with different types of play that feel good, then when one part, right, when clit can't take it anymore or else you're going to come, you can pivot and start touching something else and it's already warmed up, it's already engaged, you're not going to backslide in the arousal cycle, you're not going to lose all of that momentum that you've built up, but you're going to buy yourself a little bit more time, um, which is really important if you're somebody who doesn't have a uh, copious like fluid producing abilities on your own, right? Like I never drink enough water. I take a lot of antihistamines. I've taken SSRIs in my lifetime. Like I am a dry person. I know this about myself. I need to be hydrated. If I have a dry mouth, I have no reason to believe that any of my other bits are going to be particularly um, wet, right? So we need to account for those things. Uh, and if you're someone who's in a perpetual state of not being super moist, um, you might need to draw that process out even more and also drink some water that day, right? Make sure that you're hydrated. I'm not saying fill your bladder, but make sure that your body is hydrated. Um, okay, so you're stretching out the plateau phase, right? You're pulling out all the stops. You're playing with nipples and earlobes and your butthole, which is great. Um, you're putting pressure on your pubic mound. Maybe you're having some oral sex with your partner. You're doing all of the things to really like build up so, 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 so much arousal and get yourself pretty close. Um, then we're going to go for touching the sponges, right? So fortunately, because these sponges are more or less in the same place and respond to more or less the same kinds of stimulation, which is often different types of rhythmic pressure, um, you can take the techniques that I'm going to go over and use them really on either body. Um, so one, one way of stimulating sponge that I think is always kind of overlooked is external pressure, right? These sponges are, they're 360 degrees and we don't want to touch them from just one side, especially if we're trying to put really intense pressure on them. So maybe one thing that we're going to try is pushing down on the pubic mound or pushing on the pubic bone, right? Because in both bodies, the sponge is behind the pubic bone. So if we're putting pressure on it, we're indirectly putting pressure on the sponge. If you've ever watched uh, porn that really heavily centers ejaculation, um, particularly in someone in the vulva, you might have seen like the person who's topping them is like pressing on their belly with one hand while they're like finger fucking them with the other. And um, that's what they're doing. They're creating more and excess pressure, which is going to be really effective for wringing out that sponge. So something that we might be experimenting with, which is really great before we've done any penetration is using the palm of our hands to put firm pressure on the pubic bone and then using the pads of our fingers to tease another area. If you're playing with someone with a cock, you might be putting pressure with one hand and playing with their cock with the other or putting pressure and using the pads of your fingers to play with their taint or their asshole and kind of warm it up before you penetrate them. 
If you're playing with someone with a vulva, you might use the, pat, the palm of your hand to put pressure on their pubic bone and the pads of your fingers to tease their vaginal opening before you penetrate them, right? Because so we're never just stuffing our fingers into anybody. We want holes that are hungry and ready and receptive and begging to be filled, not that are just being given or stuffed um, with our fingers right away. And when we're penetrating, by the way, we're curling our fingers into a body. Like we're pressing on a doorbell, pressing with the pads of our fingers and pressing our way in. Not poking our way in, not like we're trying to stuff a chicken, um, but like we're just trying to kind of slip inside uh, in this, this really pleasant and filling way. So once you've got a finger or two inside of your partner, a couple of techniques that you might use to simulate their sponge are, um, one that you've probably heard at some point is the come hither motion, right? So I've penetrated, and by the way, if you're playing with someone with a cock and a prostate, um, I would really recommend beginning to explore prostate play with that person laying on their back. It's gonna be comfortable for them. They're gonna have a little bit more control over your depth than if they were on all fours, um, and it makes it really easy for you to play with their cock at the same time and keep that arousal up, right? Um, or for them to play with their cock or whatever. So. You've got your receptive partner, you've got your fingers inside of them. Um, our both prostate and urethral sponge or G-spot are kind of on that upper wall towards the belly button. So if they're laying on their back, we're aiming up, um, maybe about two inches or so. I'm not gonna give you like exact specifications because everybody's a little bit different, um, but you might feel a sort of a full like walnut-y or roof of your mouth kind of texture when you found the sponge. And of course, communicate with the person that you're penetrating, right? How does that feel? They might notice um, as you're starting to stimulate their sponge, a warm, hot, full feeling that's kind of different from just uh, being fucked. So we're inside and we're doing the come hither motion, right? And what we're doing when we're doing this is kind of milking that sponge, whatever sponge it is. We're taking, we're encouraging that fluid if they have a G-spot to kind of come, come downwards, come towards me, come out, come play. Um, and if you have a prostate, you're doing this like rhythmic pressure, right? So come hither, come hither is one thing we can try. Come hither, come hither can be a lot of work on your fingers and also is a lot of curling inside of the body. Something you might try instead is hooking your fingers, making a nice little hook out of them, and then just jiggling your arm back and forth, right? So we're <laughs> changing the muscles for a minute, letting our forearm and our bicep do some of the work, and just jiggling our arm back and forth. Um, one of the nice things about this is that you can do it slowly and let your partner ride your fingers a little bit. Let the person who's being penetrated find the rhythm, find the angle that feels good for them. Um, and pay attention, right? Pay attention to what their hips are doing. If they've found a rhythm, go with that rhythm. You can transition into taking over if you're mimicking what they're trying to do on your hand. Um, something else that you might try, I like to call, okay, so let's imagine that the person that we're penetrating has flipped over, right? They're facing downwards now, is a G-spot DJ. So you're like, scratch that, like freeze frame, where you're just making these gentle circular motions, right? Kind of, they're, now they're facing you. Um, you're, the pads of your fingers, if we flip them over or going this way, making gentle circles underneath their sponge, right? Because we can press, particu um, particularly in someone with a vulva who has a, a G-spot urethral sponge, it's possible to press so hard that you close your urethra right off and that fluid that you've built up can't actually get out. So you might need something that's really stimulating but a little bit gentler. Um, definitely experiment with these different techniques but pay attention to how the person you're giving them to is responding. Are their hips pushing towards you? Are their hips pulling away? Does their face look happy? Does their face look like it's in pain? Are they breathing? Um, check in with each other. But um, these are three simple ways that you can try um, playing with a sponge. Um, make sure that you use lots of lube for whatever kind of hole that you're penetrating, even if you're playing with someone on the vulva who makes a lot of their own lubrication. Um, adding lubrication is like, using chapstick versus licking your lips, right? It's gonna make a big difference in how much glide you have. And the name of the game with sponge play is pressure, not friction. Friction can get us feeling kind of raw, kind of irritated and not able to withstand penetration for a very long time, which is what we need to, um, we need to be able to do when we're doing, when we're doing sponge play. The prostate does have a, a texture that you might be able to feel. It might be a little bit more difficult, I would say, when you're playing with a prostate. Um, it's, it's more helpful to look to the person who's being touched to identify when you found that spot. 
but when it's really full, you will feel that there's there's a gland there that is um, is is fuller and different from the like give and stretchy texture of the rest of the rectum. Um, and particularly if you're touching prostate, if you're putting something to butt, if you're doing anal G-spotting on someone with a vulva, you must, 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 must use lube. Nobody's asshole is self-lubricating. Um, water-based lube is great because it's universal, but because it's water-based, just like your body, your body may drink it up. You might have to reapply pretty frequently. So make sure you keep it handy. Um, if you're not using toys or you're using toys that are only made of glass or stainless steel, Silicone lube is a really great option, which is uh, typically really hypoallergenic and super, super long lasting. Just make sure that you never put silicone lube on any silicone toys that you might have. Um, toys, by the way, can be super, super handy for sponge play. Um, sometimes we just like can't quite reach or can't move our fingers that way for that long or need, uh, need something else while we're using our mouth up here and our arm down here and whatever. Uh, if you're looking for a good toy for sponge play, something that's really curvy, um, obviously, right, because we're curving up towards those sponges is going to be great, and something that has a really bulbous end on either side. So I'm going to show you what is, in my opinion, the single greatest sex toy ever made. Um, this is called the Pure Wand. It's from Enjoy. It's made of stainless steel, so it's really smooth and frictionless, right, so we can do lots of pressure with minimal irritation, really, really heavy to wring out a nice full sponge, and really bulbous. So if you imagine this kind of entering into a hole and then either just pulling back and forth or rocking and tapping, you're gonna get this nice smooth lip kind of creating that pulling sensation, right? Um, highly, highly recommend, totally unisex, so easy to sanitize, like truly an heirloom piece. Um, but if you're someone who prefers dildos, um, dildos with like a big pronounced coronal ridge or crown or a thick head or that are really curvy are gonna be great. If you have a dick of your own attached to you and that dick has an angle, um, that it, that it curves at, try to line your body up with your partner so that the angle of your body is pointing towards their belly button, right? So then you're aiming for their sponge, um, whatever kind of sponge they have. And then of course you always have your, your hands available to you. Um, okay. So that's the, that's the quick and dirty that I wanted to tell you guys today about sponge play. Um, if you're local to New York, I'm going to be teaching a full length two hour version of this class at our Upper East Side location on February 20th from 8 to 10. You don't have to sign up or anything, just show up. If you're in one of our other locations, check out pleasurechest.com to see our listing of uh, other workshops in Chicago and LA. Um, I really hope that y'all enjoyed this. It was my first time doing a, a live class um, and thanks so much for participating. Bye.